Good morning. Hello and welcome. My name is Bhuvan Apurvajha. This is the Editorial Edge. And on the agenda today, we have two topics from geography. So, uh, the students of geography will enjoy that discussion. Okay. Both of them have to do with current affairs. And uh, one of them is important. Why? Because you get to test not just your basics, but you also get to go ahead and say, understand what is the definition of a continent. Okay. So, the first topic that I have for you today is on Zealandia, the eighth continent, also now being known as the missing continent, okay, of the coast of New Zealand, okay, in fact, that whole area of New Zealand. So, what exactly is it? You know, how is it that you define a continent and where was this continent all this while? You know, if it was right there, what was uh, the difficulty in, say, spotting it, locating its boundaries? We'll understand that. That's agenda number one. Agenda number two is Pangaea Ultima. Now, this has also been in the news. Uh, Science.com uh, and Science Review both carried this article. Thereafter, all the other portals followed. Okay. And you find that, say, scientists have postulated a model because what we do know is, say, our plates are again floating. They are all, say, dynamic objects that are floating on the surface of the earth. And they are postulating that in, say, around 250 million years, they are all going to come together again, fuse, become one, and uh, you can understand what happens thereafter. Okay. And bear in mind that we are also going to factor in climate change, global warming, and also the increased level of radiation that you can expect from the sun in the coming 100 million years. Okay. So what's going to happen? Well, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. But we'll nonetheless go ahead and uh, go ahead and deal with that topic. That's agenda number two. And agenda number three is, well, recently what caught my eye was this recent uh, uh, case that has been filed on a major automobile company regarding the allegation that their airbags failed to deploy, leading to the uh, unfortunate demise of the rider, the driver inside. Okay. So, we'll understand how do exactly airbags deploy, you know. What is the mechanism, firstly? What, is the, what are the major chemicals that I used? And what happens? What are the conditions in which an airbag may not deploy? Okay. Once again, the basics of SNT. So, we'll seek to understand these three topics, right? Also, I have given you, say, the questions that, I, the question, the uh, means related question that I had provided for yesterday, okay. So, many students have sent in their answers, some really good answers, and some students have asked me for some more time to send in the answers. So, what I have decided is that we will go ahead and give you the time till, say, Sunday and discuss the whole answer, the model answer, as well as the points to that question that was put forth for your perusal in yesterday's class, in the Monday morning class, right. Meanwhile, all those of you who have sent me your answers, you can expect my feedback starting tomorrow afternoon. All right. Okay, let's get started. Let's see, by the way, which of my friends are joining me this morning? Bulbul, Bul, Dr. Sriram, Coder, your neighbor, Ganfan, Ram Ramji. Good morning, all of you. Thank you for joining, guys. Let's get started. This is my Telegram channel. Oh, no, it is my Instagram channel. I always make this mistake. Regardless, this is my Instagram channel. This is where you connect with me if you have any particular doubts. Okay. Any particular strategy related guidance that you might so require and if you think I am I'm fit enough to go ahead and help you there, go ahead, connect with me here. Okay, here is also my email ID and the entire PDF of this lecture comprising the three topics, Zealandia, Pangaea, Ultima and how do airbags deploy. You will find that uploaded on this very channel. Scan this, it will take you to the Telegram channel, access it and use it as part of your revision. Okay, because eventually only the key points are covered through in these particular PDFs. Okay. Aishu, good morning, good morning, welcome, welcome. Okay, let's look at this now. Zealandia, right? Newly discovered eighth continent. So first, let's understand what has been happening, the facts of the case. Scientists have created a newly refined map of the eighth continent of the world, Zealandia. Obviously, how do you go ahead and determine that? Firstly, you go ahead deep into the sea, okay? You look at the seabed, the rocks, and then thereafter, you figure out the age of the rocks, and thus, they have done this, you know? They dredged off the coast of New Zealand, figured out the rock samples, you know, conducted extensive surveys on them. And now they have gone ahead and finally said, well, you know what? We do have an eighth continent, Zealandia. Now, if you go ahead and ask students of geography from various continents, the different continents, you know, there is no uniform number on the number of continents, right? So, for example, if I were to go ahead and ask you, say, why is Russia considered a part of Europe and not Asia? When it's quite clear that it's, it's part of the Eurasian uh, plate, you know, it's part of a singular plate. Yes. So, what is the reason? Sometimes what you find is that these demarcations are done not just because of the geological reasons, but also the political reasons. Right. So, Russia wanted to be a part of Europe 
didn't want to be identified with Asia, which is why arbitrarily you find that today Russia is included in the conversation around Europe. Okay. So this is important for us to consider before we go ahead and determine what are the criteria which are necessary for say demarcation of a continent. Okay. So you have say plates. Now one way that the scientists wanted to go ahead and demarcate continents was say look at plate tectonics. Now you might know by now, say we have continental plates, right? Fully continental plates, partially continental plates, some plates that are submerged, some plates that are emerged. For example, the South American plate, yes? So it has both land and ocean within it and you find that say it is what? More than 50% ocean, okay? Then you have some minor plates, say the Juan de, Co uh, Juan de Fuca plate, right? All of these plates are again no guarantee to go ahead and determine my continental boundaries. Absolutely no help. Which means you needed to go ahead and determine some other criteria on which you were going to go ahead and say determine what constitutes a continent and what doesn't. So before I go ahead and explain to you Zealandia, let's look at what exactly are the criteria that is required for a continent to be called a continent. Okay. So number one, you have high elevation rate relative to regions flawed by oceanic crust. Essentially, that you need to be higher than the oceans. Okay. Fine enough, good enough. So what you find is that in Zealandia's case, 94% of the entire plate is thought to be submerged. Just 6% is above the ocean water. Okay. Now, obviously, this 6% constitutes this day's New Zealand. Okay. The New Caledonia Islands, which is again an administered territory, a French overseas territory. Okay. So when you consider the Zealandia whole conversation around it. Okay. So what is emerged? What is above the surface of the ocean? You are looking at New Zealand. Okay. You are also looking at the New Caledonia, which is again a French overseas territory, right? And the area around, say, the Polynesian territory, all of those. So now you find that, yes, fair enough, Zealandia does go ahead and satisfy this criteria. Good enough. Number two, a broad range of, well, different sites of rocks. Why has this been included? Now, the intelligence student who has gone through his NCRTs, his or her NCRTs, they will tell you, that this criteria has been included specifically to go ahead and say, leave out your oceanic crust as well as your volcanic islands, right? That you do not want igneous material. You want to have rocks of all kinds that are found on your continent. Once again, the scientists who went ahead and say, explored Zealandia, right? Thomas Mortimer being the first one. You find that, well, they did find all the three kinds. So yes, Zealandia does satisfy this category too, right? Number three, thicker crust and lower seismic velocity structure than oceanic crustal regions. Now understand this simply. What is thought of is that when we had the Pangaea, right? So we broke up into well, Laurentia and Gondwana land, Angara land and Gond whichever we understand it, Laurentia and Gondwana land. Okay. Now Gondwana land had all of these different plates, right? Indo plate was there, Indo Australian plate was there, South American plate was there, Antarctic plate was there, and also was the Zealandia plate. Now, once they all started going towards their different directions, what you found was that stretching of this plate happened. Because of that, some crustal thinning was observed. This is akin to almost pulling like a band that you have. The more you pull it, the thinner it becomes. This is the exact concept. In spite of that, that even though say thinning of the continent or thinning of the crust was observed, right? Even then what you find is that Zealandia does lie above the ocean region, right? It does have a substantial amount of its say, entire area that lies above the ocean region. So once again, Zealandia does go ahead and satisfy this criteria too. Now comes the important part. Well-defined limits around a large enough area. Firstly, my problem with this is this is a vague term. To be considered a continent rather than a microcontinent or a continental fragment. So now here is the problem. There is an arbitrary number that is determined to go ahead and satisfy my criteria for a continent. Okay. No sense to it. What it essentially means is that you are looking at an area of what? 1 million say square kilometers. Above that, if you have an area, well, you are good enough. You are going to be considered a continent. But then there is no scientific evidence as to why only that particular threshold has been considered. Why 1 million square kilometers? Why not say 999999? Why not? Okay. So that is also one point. So what you find is, that in terms of Zealandia, it is higher than, and its area is much higher than, say, Madagascar. And 
it's smaller than say Greenland. It lies somewhere in the middle. Because of that, there is a large scale disagreement on whether Zealandia should now be considered as a continent. Bear in mind, it fulfills these three conditions easily. The only condition it fails to fulfill in is because of this vagueness that has been introduced in the definition. What exactly constitutes a large enough area for a continent to be considered a continent? Right? There is no clear demarcation in terms of the area requirement for a continent, a continental fragment and a microcontinent. Now, the books will tell you, well, this is the particular number. But then what is the justification for that number? Or was that number arrived at arbitrarily? Right? That is the problem. So therein you find that Zealandia loses out. Now let's go ahead and understand what exactly have the scientists found. Okay? Dilna, Preetam, Gunjan. Good morning, good morning guys, all of you. Thank you for joining this morning. Welcome, welcome. Right, so let's look at this now. So what, what the whole story now? So around say 83 million years ago, this entire supercontinent of Gondwana was splitting apart. Geological forces acting. You had all of these different continents that were now moving into the places that we now see, see today. Okay. In terms of today's discussion, guys, if you go ahead and take a like in a linear format, if you try to understand. So we are going to go ahead and start from say the uh, Pangaea phase, go up to today. And then in the second topic, we are going to once again go ahead and fuse all of these continents together and form what is ultimately known as the Pangaea Ultima. That the ultimate phase of this fusion between continents, 250 million years down the line. Okay. So this is where we stand right now. Around 83 million years ago, Gondwana split apart. Thus was born Zealandia. 94% submerged. Okay. This is the problem. That say majority of this proposed continent is underwater. But that does not mean that it is an oceanic plate or it's an oceanic continent. No. What you find is that it is in fact a continental crust that has just gone underwater. Okay. Why once again? Because of the crustal thinning, which is why the lower elevation, thus the water coming in. Okay. Now the study unveils geological patterns hinting at the subduction zone near the Campbell Plateau. Okay. First, if you go ahead and understand and look at Zealandia here. Have a look at this. So this is my Australia. Okay. You are looking at a strait that is going and separating Australia and New Zealand. Right. Now, firstly, here you have two particular features that you need to be aware of. Okay. When you're looking at dividing Zealandia, first you have North Zealandia, which is this. And then you have Southern Zealandia, which is this. Right. Now, in terms of how are they separated, there are two particular regions, two particular elements that you need to be aware of. One is the Alpine Fault. Okay. And you also are looking at the second pro province or the second factor here, the Kermandek Trench. Okay. I would suggest that go ahead and make a note of this from the exam perspective because, well, this is a ready-made MCQ here. So where do you find, say, the Kermandek Trench and the Alpine Fault? Primarily, obviously, Alpine Fault is to do with the whole migration of Antarctica. But in terms of, say, the modern day geography, you're looking at these two elements that go ahead and, uh, and say, separate my North and South Zealandia. Now, for those of you who are watching me right now, very quickly tell me, what is that particular element that separates Australia and New Zealand? What type of sea or what type of water body is present that separates Australia and New Zealand? That essentially is this body. Okay, go ahead and have a look. I think there's also a cricket team by the name of that particular sea. Okay, so have a look at that and let me know very quickly in the chat box. Meanwhile, the study unveils geological patterns hinting at a subduction zone near the Campbell Plateau. Magnetic anomalies weren't found in this region, countering previous strict slip, strict slip, uh, strike slip fault theories. Okay, so you are going to expect magnetic anomalies wherever you have this strike slip uh, subduction happening. This particular interaction is strike slip in mode. Okay, now that wasn't observed here. So what, what did the scientists finally go ahead and postulate? Essentially, finally, they say that the Campbell magnetic anomaly system resulted in stretching of Gondwana. That after Gondwana broke up into these different continents, what was observed was that the continent of, say, Zealandia underwent stretching. Because it underwent stretching, you had crustal thinning, right? And thus, the anomaly is to do with that crustal thinning 
rather than any sort of say strike slip uh, fault system okay so you all know now subduction involves one crustal edge forcing another into earth's mantle thus no magnetic anomalies here in this region okay once again make note of this okay extremely extremely like important to understand why zealandia is essentially submerged why is 94% of zealandia underwater and 6% just on the surface of the land okay so you have say southern american continent that did not go stretching but underwent compression which is why you had mountain formations there okay whereas in the case of zealandia pulled in opposite directions which means that the total height of the uh, uh, the uh, continent went down okay that is the whole concept that you need to grasp meanwhile i think i have the right answer yes correct tasman sea absolutely okay you also looking at two important uh, uh, particular geological features in this area one is the bolons sea mount and the gilbert sea mount now sea mount again a volcanic sort of element okay sea mounts and gyots discussed in ncert several times okay and so you find these two sea mounts again important features just south of uh, southern zealandia of the campbell plateau right now this is again an important uh, place not just from the geological perspective from the geographical perspective but you're also looking at this area right this also area is the home of the maoris which is why they have a particular name for this entire place called as teriu a maui right so teriu a maui these are the maori region essentially okay now let's look at this i have got this from the website of uh, usgs have a look at this zealandia has the features of earth's seven other continents elevation above surrounding oceanic crust yes diverse geology yes crust thicker than that of oceans yes now this is where the problem is area greater than 1 million square kilometer even though you find that say the entire area of zealandia is around 5 million square kilometers yes you find that scientists around the world are divided to give the status of continent to zealandia right primarily again some are, some are to do with why again it is submerged some are to do with its area but what is undeniable is that in terms of the criteria for fulfillment of uh, the continent it fulfills most of them in fact all of them now the questions that you can expect one identify the criteria for the identification of or the demarcation of a continent in which case you are advised to know these five points or the third slide that i presented before you okay you are also expected to know about the break up of the pangaea the fleeing of the different continents towards their present day positions and eventually what were the forces that determined all of this because eventually these are large mass bodies yes even though we assume and we know that they are floating on the say, surface of the planet what was the energy that was going and driving this entire process right so you need to identify these from the examination perspective now that you have understood this very quickly let's go ahead and have a look at this question okay new caledonia in the pacific ocean is an overseas territory of which of the above okay usa france uk none of the above your neighbor sir why is greenland not a continent so again the problem was that uh, in terms of demarcation okay this 1 million kilometer demarcation that has been provided okay this 1 million square kilometer demarcation that has been provided is again arbitrary right so you find that in terms of zealandia your neighbor what you find is that say for example you have greenland here okay and say madagascar here right zealandia lies somewhere in the middle okay in terms of just area now what you find is that even people are going to not accept greenland's position as an independent continent why again because they are looking at say several models that say that it is a part of the north american system several models say that well you are looking at uh, the diverse geology and geography that is to be expected in a continent absent there you know when you look at the different uh, four five criteria that is there once again greenland fails say one or two or three of them okay once again which is why it is say stripped of the uh, status of an independent continent okay or it is not so what is the way forward so for example like planets we have dwarf planets right can we have dwarf continents then you know that is again one opinion from the examination perspective we ought to have that is that say method uh, replicable when it studying when you are studying your own continent another question now that your neighbor you have brought it up one question that comes to my mind is 
say we are still unaware of the continents within our own surface what does that tell you about humanity's say quest for knowledge of its own surface or beneath its surface you know one of the primary accusations that is often made is in the space versus sea race that space often is glamorous whereas sea is often neglected but the key for say mankind's existence comes with effective management of the sea and knowledge of what lies underneath the sea right so so that is again one question that you need to be probably going and analyzing and forming an opinion on why is it that say 2023 finally we are coming to the fact that yes we had an eighth continent you know if exactly if we knew so much about our own planet earth this knowledge should have come much earlier right so these are the primary questions that one can think of not just from the say a prelims perspective but also from the perspective of the mains examination right let's look at this now identify the incorrect options what i suggest my friends my students what you should do or what i request you to in fact is the questions that i have for you go ahead and answer them in a linear format you guys have been most consistent with your answers leave the answers for me in the comment box okay i have around 4 5 questions go ahead listen to the lectures and answer your uh, questions the questions to the answers answers to the question in the comment box okay first option continental boundaries are defined by plate boundaries true or false second question plates can contain both land and ocean within them true or false okay indo australian plate is a fully continental plate like i told you you are looking at plates that can either be fully continental okay or fully or partially continental and which means land plus ocean both or you are looking at totally oceanic so you will go ahead and tell me whether the indo australian plate is a fully continental plate identify the incorrect options right my friends that is zealandia for you meanwhile if you are understanding if you are firstly if you are not unaware, if you are unaware of this entire discussion around zealandia well here is breaking news and if you understood the concepts behind it go ahead and quickly leave me a like you know it's it's firstly i enjoy teaching okay so and and this uh, appreciation you know i often get mails from my students and that's is the fuel i can assure you you know nothing pushes me to wake up every morning at 3 am go through the different portals newspapers why because i know that a set of students are expecting me to go live at 6:30 and together we go ahead and learn and discuss a lot so that is again the primary focus of the prelims to interview initiative too you know where the student is at the centerpiece of our entire teaching model that the student's concept clarity is of prime importance student's ability to solve question is of prime importance if he or she is to succeed in the civil services examination okay and so if you want to go ahead and if you resonate with the way we approach topics here at study iq is english what i suggest is that this new batch that is starting on the 30th of september you know go ahead and look at the course deliverables what is included in the course look at the faculty profile you know the rest of the say uh, riff raff you know you have say free books and you come and study with here by the way the first of its kind that once you clear prelims you come in new delhi study with us at our own campus you know free of cost so go ahead and make use of this opportunity why because when well when we were preparing this wasn't available people had to sell their lands to come to new delhi and, and study and prepare for upsc and that's an unsustainable workable unworkable model that's an undesirable model you know education shouldn't strip someone of their dignity so go ahead look at this particular uh, course deliverable and when you do decide to sign up use the code b a l i v e why firstly you get a good discount and secondly well we start studying every day for 4 to 5 hours on a consistent basis right from the breakup of pangea now to the fusion of pangea okay so as we know 2023 firstly let's understand the facts of the case once again okay our plates are on the move right you have say the uh, indo plate that is hitting against the eurasian plate our mount everest is still rising right so you have these different plates that are in movement in different different directions now the scientists have postulated a model in which they are expecting that because of this uh, interplate movement one day you are going to have a situation where all of these plates will together come back and fuse and what was say the original pangea and this they are naming as pangea ultima okay so let's look at it in about 250 million years all continents will converge to form earth's next supercontinent pangea ultima now the problem with that besides obviously say that we will be long gone by then the problem with that is that in 250 million years first things first that the earth will experience increased solar radiation now you might ask me why 
So, well, if you go ahead and ask and if you have a chance ever to interact with a dinosaur, they will tell you that when they were, uh, ro say, roaming on the surface of this planet, right, at that time, the sun was almost like a dim bulb. Compare that to now and, well, the sun is quite quite uh, harsh in its uh, radiations and this harshness is only going to keep on increasing because the sun eventually is also becoming mature and it is obviously a star which means eventually the sun will also die someday right and as it continues in that journey you find that it is going to become much more say its radiation will be much more potent the intensity of the radiation is going to keep on increasing until that day it runs out of its fuel right so this is expected which means that say in 250 million years, firstly, the sun's radiation is going to be increasing, number one. Number two, you are looking at, well, climate change that would have exacerbated by then, you know. Already we are hitting peak temperature levels in many areas, which is again threatening food security systems, nutritional outcomes and eventually the survival of mammals. Mammals, insects, all sorts of species are now slowly heading towards what could be considered as an extinction level event, okay. So let's look at it. A natural consequence of the creation and decay of this supercontinent will be the extremes in the CO2 levels. Have a look at this particular slide that I have for you. Okay, I've taken this from, uh, I think this is the website, physics.org. Okay, you can get, go and have a look at it if you want. I'll share the entire article on my Telegram channel. What you find is that's in 250 million years. Now look at the temperature that is expected here. These red areas are the areas of extreme temperature. Eventually, the entire continent, Pangaea Ultima, is going to be facing much more radiations. Yes, increased level of carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere because of, again, the gassing event that will follow. Obviously, anthropological reasons cannot be discounted for, which means, and obviously, one thing that you will be aware of, one thing that you will be appreciating here is that, say, the continentality effect that we talk about, you know, where you are experiencing, say, extreme temperatures because on the basis of the distance that you have from the uh, oceans or the sea. Yes. So, what do you expect to the continent continentality effect to happen? Will it increase or will it decrease? Right. Will you have the moderating influence of the sea anymore in large areas around your uh, coasts or around your uh, continent? Probably not. Eventually, it's becoming one fused continent altogether. Coupled with the fact that it is receiving more solar insulation, yes, more carbon dioxide, which means more trapping of heat, mammals are looking at extinction level ev event coming up, okay. Now, what is the problem then? For example, hibernation, yes, that say animals can go ahead, regulate their body temperature in cold weather and, and then come out all fine, yes. So, what you find is that the basic tenet of science, how human evolution has worked, what you find is that say mammals are able to regulate their body temperature well in cold conditions. The problem arises in hot conditions where your sweating capacity is only till a limit. After that, if your body temperature keeps increasing and if your body does not sweat out in equivalent proportion, the chances are that you will first collapse and thereafter slip into a coma and then eventually pass away. Right? So that is the entire process that eventually evolution also is not on our side. Right? which means again an extinction level event is quite acceptable, quite expected in fact. Okay, let's look at this. Increased carbon dioxide, solar energy and continentality leading to increasing warming hostile to mammalian life. Now this is the point that I was making, that together and you and I will both agree that you will find people adapting and adopting the ways of say high altitude within a short span of time. The moment to acclimatize, you are good to go, yeah. You flew from New Delhi to Leh and, Leh and Ladakh, you acclimatize for one day, the second day you go ahead, enjoy your tourism activities there. But the moment the conditions are reversed, if you are going ahead in a hot environment, yes, without any say a particular uh, reprieve, after a certain level, your body sweat is eventually going to be, you know, you are pushing your body, no matter how much you sweat, your body is not cooling down, right. So, while mammals have evolved to lower their cold temperature survival limit, the upper temperature tolerance has remained constant, which is why this Pangaea Ultima is looking at an extinction level event, right? So, it's a triple whammy. Number one, continentality effect. Number two, hotter sun and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? Thus, we will be 
unable to shed this heat through sweat, no cooling of our bodies, which means extinction, right? Now, this is the point that I wanted to make, that even the sun's radiation is going to keep on increasing in the coming years. Why? Because the sun is becoming mature and eventually it will be headed towards its death, right? The death of a star, which means eventually at this particular stage, its radiation is going to be a lot, lot higher. So, for example, when our dinos were on the surface of the earth, we could consider the sun to be young, right? Which means its radiation at that time was close to say 15 to 20 percent less than what it is today, right? So, this is the whole concept that you need to understand that as the earth gets older, our universe also gets older. It's getting older as we go day by day, year by year, million of years, million, years, million of years thereafter. And eventually all of these processes are linked. So, the problem so arises now that will, will we, we, we be able to survive at that time? You know, will human beings exist at 250 million years? Well, no one knows for sure. What does one do know is that certain areas of this Pangaea Ultima are only going to be habitable. Okay, that the temperature will be extremely high in other areas. So, which are the uh, areas where temperature will be habitable? The areas that are closer to the ocean, right? Where the moderating influence of the sea is, is there to negate the continentality of, of the land and the ocean, right? Those are the only areas. The inland areas are the ones where, say, life, plant life, mammalian life, insect life may not survive, okay? So, this is the Pangaea Ultima. Again, an important news related to geography. I'll again, if you so desire, I'll share the article link in my Telegram channel too. Okay. Let's look at this question that I have for you now. Which of the above may be considered as remnants of the Paratethys Ocean? Okay. So, you had Pangaea, right, surrounded by what was Panthalassa, which is present-day Pacific. Pangaea breaks up, Laurentia and Gondwana. And eventually, you have another body that is created here, which is known as the Tethys Sea. So, you, your, your answer is to just straight away figure out and tell me, what happened to the Tethys Sea? Yes, what happened to it? Is, it, is there uh, the remnants of the Tethys Sea? Where would you expect to find it? For example, today you might say that the Panthalassa could be considered as say the precursor or the father of present day Pacific Ocean. What about Tethys? You will let me know. The options being Mediterranean Sea, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Arabian Sea. Okay, bear in mind that this is an MCQ. Okay. I normally don't give options because again, UPSC, if you have to prepare well for the UPSC, you have to move beyond options. So, multiple uh, correct, go ahead and identify those for me. Right, question number four, extreme weather conditions due to higher altitude, option B, extreme weather conditions due to lower altitude, option C, extreme weather conditions due to distance from rivers and lakes, and D, extreme weather conditions due to distance from seas and oceans. Which of the above may be considered as the continentality effect? Okay, I think we have discussed the entire concept in detail. Shouldn't be a problem to answer these two very simple questions for you. Right? That was Pangaea Ultima, my friends. Once again, if you have any doubts, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Okay? Geography and Environment IR are my core subjects. Okay? I can help you with those subjects in forming a strategy and clearing your doubts. Right? So, don't hesitate. Reach out to me. And well, go ahead and benefit out of this entire exercise. Now, let's look at this. So, we had a recent accident. A prominent Indian car manufacturer is alleged that their car did not have airbags, which led to the unfortunate demise of the driver. Okay. The driver's uh, family went ahead and lodged a formal complaint against this automobile company. And thus, we have, say, this entire thing playing out on social media. Now, the interest, the interest point for you and I as civil service aspirants okay how does airbag work what what is the mechanism first things first you're looking at sensors that do the whole thing okay that sensors eventually identify the rate of deceleration okay and that rate of deceleration has a certain benchmark so if you go from say 100 to 0 in what a second or less okay i'm again just postulating here then you have these sensors that are put into motion and thus you find that the airbags are deployed. Okay, so let's look at it. Before an airbag deploys, the control unit has to detect a crash through the sensors. Now, the crash sensors go ahead and determine the rate of deceleration, but they are not going to be affected by the normal stopping and starting. So the benchmark of deceleration is extremely high. Okay, 
So the benchmark or the rate of deceleration has to be extremely high for your airbags to function, which means if you go ahead and have a minor crash at say 10 km per hour, yeah, the chances are that most likely you will not have the airbags deploy. Okay. So if the sensor detects a crash, it tells me that the airbag inflator system to kick into gear. What is the compound used now? This is examination, examination material, guys. Okay. Presently, you have sodium azide that is used. But before that, when car manufacturers were going ahead and determining and designing this process, the first component that was used was tetrazole. Okay. Now, tetrazole is an extremely uh, expensive compound. Right. And well, so that negates the whole point of it because car manufacturers also have a profit margin to think of, which is why they went ahead and discarded tetrazole. Thereafter, they came up with some another product, which you'll be surprised to know is ammonium nitrate, by the way, okay, which you find in where? In our fertilizers, right? So you had ammonium nitrate also that was designed for some time, used for some time in a car, in, in a car uh, uh, airbags, ammonium nitrate being used, which is primarily used in fertilizers. Now, the problem arose because ammonium nitrate underwent changes in its solid state. So, you had a particular incident in Japan where a car airbag using ammonium nitrate as the minor explosive which finally sets into this motion. Yes. So, this immediate motion happening in less than a second, a minor explosive is used and so they decided to use ammonium nitrate. Previously, what happened was it underwent solid state change and thus you had the shrapnels of the entire car come and hit the occupants of the car. Thereafter, you find that the entire range of the cars were recalled in Japan and thus you had a new compound now that is being used, which is sodium azide, NaN3. Okay, make a note of this. This is the one that starts my chemical reaction. Okay, and you have the airbag that is filled up with nitrogen gas, thus a quick deployment of it right in your face or from the sides. Now, what are the problems? What as Indian car, uh, say, owners, what is it that we do wrong? Number one, you will find that we have this habit of putting fancy seat covers. Okay. You go ahead and invest in a car of, say, having six airbags, both on, uh, say, both sides of the door, piche bhi do, aage bhi do. And after that, you go ahead and put like a cheap seat cover on it, which kills the whole sensor. So, your side airbag deployment doesn't happen. Or you have this fancy habit of going and putting these mud guards, these bull ramps in the front of your car, at the behind your car, right? That again interferes with the functioning of the sensors. Many reasons why the sensors may not deploy. For example, if your car has turned upside down in the middle of the road, okay? Here you have another car that comes and hits you from the side. Chances are that the airbag, airbag shall not deploy because the airbag is not designed for a secondary crash. It is designed for a primary crash. That too, at a certain speed limit. Again, you go ahead and have a minor accident at 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers per hour, the airbag is not going to deploy. The seat belt is considered enough in that case. Right? So, several reasons why the airbag may not deploy, but from the examination perspective, you ought to know of the particular component and the compounds that are used in airbag deployment. Okay? So, let's look at the conditions in which the airbags will not deploy. Number one, low speed accidents, secondary crashes, Aftermarket accessories that I told you that we use, the bull bars that I use now, by the way, illegal in India. If you go ahead and uh, find a traffic policeman, well, he'll make you or he or she is going to first fine you and then get you to remove it. Fourth, airbag failure, obviously. Electronic item is bad. The fifth one, hydroplaning or aquaplaning. What does this mean? If you are driving on a wet road, okay, the contact area between your tyre and the water and the road, in fact, is hindered by water. Okay. You must have observed, if you're uh, driving on a road that is filled up with, say, a little bit of water, your tires start to make a different sound. Yes, if you have been observant enough, you must have heard of that particular sound. And as you start to speed, the sound starts to get intense. What exactly is happening? You are looking at reduced road contact due to a layer of water that is formed between the ground and your tire. This entire process is called as hydroplaning or even known as aquaplaning, which essentially you're looking at reducing the area of contact between the tire and the road. Okay, road and tire area of contact is reduced. 
Thus, your stability is reduced. Yes, you're trying to play with gravitational force therein and does, that does not normally end well. Okay. So, because of this reduced area of contact, you are supposed to, you know, you'll, you'll lose stability. You'll start to waver. You start, your st car will start to waver. Eventually, loss of contact, loss of control and thus an accident. Which is why it is often suggested that on wet roads, exercise caution, go slow. Yes, why? Because the risk is of hydroplaning or aquaplaning where you are losing the car, the tyre is losing grip with the road because of a layer of water that now exists between the two. Right? So, make note of this as to how do airbags function, why do airbags fail and more importantly, what are the components used in airbag deployment. Right, my friends? Go ahead and answer this for me. Simple question, not shouldn't be so difficult, but I do expect a question like this to be asked someday in the examination. Okay. Which of the above is used in deployment of airbags? Okay. Tetrazole, ammonium nitrate, TNT, God bless those who will use TNT, and sodium azide. You will let me know your answers. Right. So, you the PDF of this entire lecture, my friends, you will find it on this uh, Telegram channel. Meanwhile, let's look at the questions of yesterday. Right. So now, I, found, I was quite surprised to find that many of you got this incorrect. Okay. So why was it? First, an OCI is citizen of another country is where most of you got it incorrect. Please understand this. Ideally, OCI is to be understood as what? It is for a citizen of another country. Okay. Citizen of another country. Right. And the whole point is that you are giving them an opportunity to touch base with their roots, okay, and thus they are eligible for applying for citizenship, okay, they are eligible for applying for citizenship provided they meet the criteria that we discussed yesterday that you must have been a citizen of India prior to January 26, 1950 or your parents must have been there, okay, all of those criteria. So essentially, you have to understand that OCI is considered to be a citizen of another country, so that is correct. OCI possesses multiple entry long term visa for entering India. Yes, this is the privilege that is ex extended to our OCIs, one which the government of India now wants to go ahead and take away from those individuals who are uh, engaging in baseless propaganda against the Republic of India. Okay. OCI is at par with NRIs in all matters. Unfortunately, no. This is where things get different. Okay. And OCI is not entitled to the fundamental right of equality. Absolutely correct. What you find is that they can go ahead and engage in all sorts of employment, but for certain sectors such as journalism, academics or wherever, wherever you are getting into the political realm, you better inform the government or the administration or you will lose your privilege of OCI. Okay. So the incorrect statement here being only C. Right. World, sorry, Wood Wide Web. So we discussed fungal communications there yesterday, didn't we? We discussed a tract of land, right, which had many trees. And you found that you put a particular die here and that particular die was found here. So, how did that happen? Obviously, some may say the root networks, but the scientists are now postulating that it is because of fungal communication. That these networks that exist below the soil are able to communicate information and say prepare as a community as well as an individual. The fungus has a dynamic existence. Okay. So, ephemeral network of fungal interactions is absolutely correct. The rest obviously incorrect. Okay, let's look at this. Which of the above is associated with the funga? So, funga 2023, fungus is in the news. And funga is a holistic term that you use to include both flora and fauna. Okay, flora and fauna. And the organization that is going ahead and talking about this extensively is the UN Biodiversity. Right? So, your correct answer here being C. Okay. Traffic, by the way, can you tell me which organization is responsible for traffic in India. What does traffic do? Can you let me know that too? Okay. Which organization has partnered with traffic for conservation of what in India? Just let me know that too. Okay. And finally, this is the question, my friends. Yesterday again, I had uh, gone, gone and discussed the entire concept of whether Africa is the new playground of these superpowers. And what is the approach that is different in terms of the Indian approach? And I must inform you that the response has been brilliant from the students. Okay. Some of the answers are really good. And some of the students have gone ahead and built on what we discussed in the class 
and again i'm sure they have done their basic research also and included those points and that is what is suggested you know uh, i will share the model answer to this on monday morning in the editorial edge till then please go ahead look at yesterday's lecture where in the first part of the lecture we went ahead and discussed the whole concept around africa being the new playground of global superpowers okay and for this again if you haven't considered reading about it the angles that you should be going ahead and taking okay first do a comparative analysis in the approach of say united states european union russia china and france well you can go ahead and box them together okay so what is the approach difference in approach of all of these four versus the approach by india and what you will find is that this was the primary structure of our discussion yesterday which will provide you with many further points to write for this answer okay some of the answers have come and i, I will start responding to you if you have sent me your answers you will receive my feedback starting tomorrow afternoon all right to the rest of you i implore you go ahead send me your answers on my email id the email id will be mentioned earlier in the lecture you will find it there right and these are my individuals by the way who have answered some of you have might have got a question incorrect primarily the oci question is where most of you went wrong okay praveen akansha vidisha monica gopesh ulfat harshit crystal lekam vaishnavi ajay neeraja mandeep shubham kalyan koda deepanshi hani your neighbor ayush frown clown rahul and akshay thank you so much firstly okay i'm immensely grateful for your faith and your participation you know some of you send me messages of appreciation and and respect and love and i can only bow my head down and say thank you because it's a student that makes a teacher look good so uh, it's it's a more of a comment towards you as a student community that uh, i want to go ahead and serve you know the entire point of this one hour in the morning is that you go ahead and learn okay the articles that you might so miss because what you'll find is that some of the articles at times do get missed from the indian ecosystem so i didn't find many articles regarding say the pangea ultima bit which is again a very important concept you know uh, the whole concept around say a uh, news uh, zealandia you know so one or two major newspapers only carried it but not to a depth that would serve you well from the examination perspective okay so go ahead engage with this program share this with your friends those who will find this useful and if you enjoyed the three concepts yesterday if you learned something more importantly do consider leaving me a like and a comment whether good or bad uh, the feedback is always welcome theek hai that uh, brings this uh, edition to a conclusion editorial edge will be offline tomorrow that is friday okay we'll be back on monday morning uh, meanwhile i hope that uh, you will be going ahead and answering the questions of today as well as sending me your answers to the mains question that i have posed before you on my email id right till i see you monday morning uh, in the next edition of editorial edge thanks for watching this is bhuvan saying bye have a productive day ahead bye